Morning, Pete. It's uh, nice and brisk here in St. Louis, walking the dogs. And just finished up your your episode with Mara and Michael Cohen. Just wanted to thank you again for being such a guiding light <laughs> during the midterms and all this shit that's going on. Um, I really value your friendship and uh, your podcast and the types of guests you bring on. So just wanted to say thank you and keep it up. From a defabricated garden shed in Rockland County, New York, USA, this is Stand Up with Pete Dominic. On today's episode, simple yoga poses you can do without revealing your debilitating psoriasis. And now, the podcast host who can't wait to show you his new yoga pose, Pete Dominic. And thank you very much, Pete Co, as well as Zach Lewis there, a listener at the top with a very thoughtful message. Thank you, Zach, and thank you, everybody who pressed play on Stand Up, especially those who subscribe with a paid subscription. If you haven't, do it now. Actually hung out with a few listeners last night and late. I had, a, had a few drinks with Cassie and Therese, Cassie's daughters. Going to hang out with the Sandman later Thursday. Love making friends with you guys and having you in my life. And that's one of my favorite parts about doing this show every day. I've got two great guests joining me today. Dave Rothkop and Dean Obidala is back for the first time in a long time. You're going to love my conversations with both of them. And uh, the big news last night was that in Arizona, Katie Hobbs defeated Trump-backed Kerry Lake in Arizona governor's race. Hobbs, of course, is a Democrat and the Secretary of State there. She prevailed over Kerry Lake, who is a GOP star who campaigned on Donald Trump's false claims about the 2020 election. And I like this from CNN last night. Here's Kyung La over on Anderson Cooper. Between the McCain Republicans and the Trump Republicans, a fierce battle we've seen over a couple of different cycles. One of the Republicans in this state said that Carrie Lake told a legion of John McCain supporters across Arizona that they could go to hell. Tonight, they returned the favor. Well, there you go. NBC called it first, I guess, nearly a week after the polls closed. And shortly after the call was made, uh, former disgraced president Donald Trump took to his fake social media network that he owns to claim that Lake had been robbed. He said, wow, they just took the election away from Kerry Lake. Really bad out there. Uh, Kerry Lake for herself went on Twitter and appeared to also suggest the contest was rigged against her. Arizonans know BS when they see it, she wrote, but the mockery was swift and unrelenting with so many people casting her tweet as unwitting explanation as to why she lost. Clara McClaskill writes, as it turns out, yes, yes, they did. Referencing Arizona's knowing BS when they see it. Uh, Joyce Vance, Jody Vance writes, best concession speech ever around that quote. Monica Lewinsky said that's probably the most astute thing Carrie Lake has ever said. Yvette Nicole Brown, Carrie Lake, they sure do. That's why you lost, girl. Ask Sarah Palin USA how being a chick like you ultimately plays out politically. Cliff Notes version, poorly. Anywho, thanks, Arizona. Tim O'Brien tweeted, at least 50.4% of Arizonans knew bullshit when they saw it. A real self-own from Kerry Lake, and we'll see what happens there. As of Tuesday morning, House Republicans are just a couple, maybe one seat away from the House majority, and they have a far-right racist and conspiracy theorist who acts, who's the guy, I believe, who said uh, January 6th was just a bunch of tourists. He's challenging Kevin McCarthy uh, to be the speaker, so we anticipated that you'd have uh, some crazy people uh, applying for that job, whether or not he gets it. Andy Biggs is his name. Also in Arizona is uh, a long shot, I'm sure. But he announced on, I guess, Newsmax last Newsmax last night. Not too much else I want to play or say here at the top because I want to get this thing posted. And Republicans, I should just mention that for the second week, straight week, flu cases and hospitalizations and deaths have doubled. Go get that flu shot if you haven't gotten it already. I got mine. I had no problem. It's, uh, it was great. I enjoyed it. I actually uh, was aroused by it. I'm just saying that. So maybe you'll consider getting your flu shot if you haven't yet. 
All right, well, let me get to my guest then. How about that? Let's get started. Dean Obidala coming up. We had a great conversation. Haven't talked to him in a long time. But first, one of my all-time favorite regulars now is Dave Rothkopf. Dave just published his new book, American Resistance, which you got to get. So, so good. The inside story of how the deep state saved the nation. Also, listen to his podcast, Deep State Radio. They always have good guests over there and his old umbrella podcast. We talk a little bit about them at the end of today's show and we covered a lot. So I want to get right to it. Lots of great stuff from Dave and then Dean Obidala. So why don't we do it, shall we? Oh, and don't forget to thank David on Twitter at DJ Rothkop. If you haven't followed him, follow him and thank him for joining me. Here we go. Oh, yeah, look who I got. Dave Rothkopf. Can I say publicly that you've, uh, congratulations, you've become a, a grandfather? No, don't say that. No, it's okay. You can say that. Okay. It's uh, People won't believe it because I seem so young. Yeah, I was going to say, you don't look at all like a grandfather. Nope. It's uh, many, many people, many people say, well, no one says that. Only I say that. I think, but- I think you will soon, though, like really pretty soon. Not yet, though. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm very excited for you, and I really appreciate you joining me, even though you're you're uh, going to go meet your grandchild very soon, because there's a lot of really important things to Rothkopf around with, including most recently the Chinese president and the uh, American president meeting, I guess, in Indonesia. It's the G20 and uh, I wonder if you had any thoughts about what has been read out and reported so far on their meeting. I thought it sounded like a good meeting. It was important that Biden and she got together, uh, sat down. Uh, they did so with their top teams. And, you know, they covered the ground you want to have them cover in a constructive way. So Biden said, look, we don't think, you know, aggression around Taiwan is acceptable. And she said, whatever it was, she said, Biden came away saying he didn't think there was any action imminent on that. Uh, they talked about areas where cooperation was possible. Uh, they talked about living with competition, which is core to the relationship. And at the end, they agreed to have Secretary of State Blinken go to China and carry on the discussions in the not too distant future. The U.S. China relationship is the most important bilateral relationship in the world. The people who are promoting the idea of Cold War misunderstand the relationship. There are 70,000 U.S. businesses in China. Uh, Our economies are interdependent on one another. There are a whole host of issues from pandemics to climate to nuclear nonproliferation that can't be resolved unless we work together. Uh, And so somehow we have to balance that with our concerns about them. I would say, finally, one last thing that came out of it that I thought was unexpectedly good um, is that both countries said, we don't think countries should threaten the use of nuclear weapons, which was clearly targeted at Vladimir Putin. Right. And it was kind of having his best friend and his primary adversary get together and say, stand down, buddy. And I think that was important. And in a related story, Apparently, it was. It's reported that the, the head of the CIA, Bill Burns, you probably uh, are. Good, you probably have tea with him or something. I think. I think you know him. I, I've worked very closely with Bill Burns yeah. for a long time. And Bill so, Burns is not only the head of the CIA. Bill Burns was a career diplomat who reached the highest rank. He was former Deputy Secretary of State. He's one of the most gifted diplomats the U.S. has produced in the past half century. And so the report is that he has gone to Ankara, Turkey, to meet with his counterpart in Russian intelligence to talk about these threats that Russia has made about the use of nuclear weapons and to make it absolutely clear to the Russians what a catastrophic error of judgment it would be for them to follow through on those and to make it absolutely clear that we know what they're doing that we are watching them closely, and that we will respond swiftly and severely if they do anything reckless. And the other thing I just wanted to get your response to is to try to articulate how important the accomplishment of taking back this major city in Ukraine 
was. You saw these images coming out. Harsan, I think it's pronounced. The K really throws me, but I'm trying to get it right. And then you saw Zelensky show up there. And it just seems to be a, a really amazing, widely kind of unpredicted, at least back in February thing. What do you want to say about that momentum changing, that achievement? Well, you know, Putin, in going into Ukraine, was anticipated to achieve a swift victory. He didn't. He was anticipated to take over Kiev in a matter of days. He didn't. He took over one city of size in Ukraine, a strategic city, Kherson, in the southeast of the country that is kind of a bridge to Crimea, a bridge to the Black Sea. And now Ukraine has taken it back. And they took it back with the Russians fleeing across the Dnieper River, leaving their uniforms, their helmets, and their equipment on one bank of the river as they fled to the other side. Uh, it is an ignominious defeat for the Russians. It is an important gain for the Ukrainians. You saw the video of the people of Kherson welcoming the Ukrainian army back into the city, and it looked like the U.S. liberating Paris uh, after, after uh, yeah. in the middle of World War II. And it puts the Ukrainians in an extremely good position to push forward in the east, push uh, Russia further and further out. And, you know, Zelensky went there today yeah, uh, to give you a sense of how secure they feel about it and essentially said, you know, this is, you know, the beginning point of where we can actually, you know, start to talk to the Russians about the end of this thing. Because it's as big a setback as the Russians have seen since the very first days of this second wave of invasion last February. All right. Well, let's come back home now and talk about the great Mike Pence, because he was he sat down with David Muir on ABC News last night. And they, he's got a book out, I guess. And, and he he's seemed pretty upset about January 6th. But it seems like he might have waited till after the midterm election and he talked to all the big donors to to be critical of Donald Trump. And it seemed like all the things that he told David Muir, he should be saying to the January 6th committee under under oath. But I, I saw on Twitter, you didn't you didn't have a react. You didn't have a very supportive reaction of what I think was very courageous of Mike Pence to do for what, him. What was the courageous? Part? Well, for him. Well, for him. What is that? What does that mean? The bar. You know? He's never done anything. <laughs> I mean, the, with this the mouse that squeaked. I mean, the, listen, Mike Pence was a Trump enabler for the entire administration. As recently as this week has said Trump was trying to do good things. I stand by the Trump agenda. And he has one small area where he rises up to criticize Trump in which he says, yeah, he tried to murder me. And then he goes back to, <laughs> yeah, right? Then he goes back to defending Trump. Yeah, and and you know the the I mean, and it, my fan and murder me and my family. Like his whole family could have been murdered in the most horrific way that day. And he's like, ah. Yeah, well, but, right. But then he's like, he chose. He, his words were. He chose the wrong side that day. Yeah. As if he hadn't chosen the wrong side for four straight years of his administration, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, 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 it, and it's just his language is pathetic. His book is called So Help Me God. You know, and why is it called So Help Me God? It's called So Help Me God because he is part of the Christian white nationalist movement in the United States who think that this ought to be a sort of Christian theocracy, who think that the views of Christians ought to be imposed on everybody else in the country, yeah. and who is supported in that by, you know, a large number of, 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 of MAGA Republicans, the least of which is Donald Trump. You know, I mean, I don't know if you saw that Ron DeSantis ad a week or two ago in which he practically had you know, Jesus lifting him up out of, you know, the, the, the ether and saying this is the chosen candidate, um, that there is there is at the core of the 
the minority rule movement in the U.S. And I think we can divide the parties in the U.S. There's the minority rule party and the majority rule party. All right. And, you know, the minority rule party is kind of anti-democratic on a lot of levels, kind of pro-authoritarian, white supremacist, Christian nationalist, uh, racist. And the other one, you know, is everybody else. You know, now, fortunately, uh, as we saw in the last election, time, after, you know, there are times when the majority wins still. Uh, and we put up some impediments to this minority party gaining ground. But Pence wants to lead that group. And Pence wants to somehow get credit for being courageous on January 6th while being cowardly and accommodating to Trump for the preceding 1,300 days. Yeah. Yeah. Very well said. And I, you got to wonder if those Christian nationalists types, right wing evangelicals would vote for one of them, Mike Pence or Herschel Walker or Donald Trump. I don't know. It's weird who they vote for and who they don't. It would seem it's not so much about it's their a, it's, it's, religion. It's, well, it's not about religion. I mean, first of all, those Christian evangelicals, I mean, some of those people. It, it looks like they are guided by pr doing precisely the opposite of what the Bible. Uh, right. Cruelty. Do, right. <laughs> but 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 they are the most sort of down and dirty, pragmatic movement you will ever see. And if they think they can get a candidate who wins, they will support him. And right. the perfect example of that is Trump, who literally, if God wrote a book, and in the book, there was a chapter called People Who Will Go to Hell. And you open the book, there would be a picture of Donald <laughs> Trump. Right? It would and, pop up. He'd pop right up. It would just be a, like, yeah, it would be a pop up it's in me. the book. And, and, right. And, the, and they're like, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. We'll take the oh. serial sex abuser, fraudster, traitor, liar, and we'll back him. If he allows us to advance our agenda on abortion, if abortion was their only concrete motivator and kind of policy or law that they could change and they got it changed in many states, what does that mean for the movement? Because it seems to a lot of people's analysis, I think I agree, is that th there's a real backlash to outlawing women's health care choices. And so they got it across the finish line with all these judges. The Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, the Dobbs decision, and then they lost the historic uh, election where they should have won. And a lot of people are connecting those dots. So where do they go from here? Well, first of all, you know, these are not master strategists and they are very, very um, focused on imposing their worldview on everybody. And as Clarence Thomas noted in the Dobbs decision, there are places to go after you take away women's reproductive rights. You can take away the right of people to choose who they marry. You can take away the right to contraception. You can take away the right to teach certain things in the schools or to give certain books in libraries. Yeah. I mean, they, I just saw a story today about some library in Michigan getting shut down because the local you know, there was some local right wing group pressuring them to get rid of books with LGBTQ themes or something like that. And they wouldn't do it. So the the board that funds the library said, OK, we're not going to fund you anymore. So they're going to keep going after this thing. The problem is, you know, the the one percenters who control the Republican Party, who also have been very cynical and have essentially said, who can we get on our team so that we have enough votes so that we can keep cutting our taxes and rolling back regulation, you know, they chose to get in bed with the evangelicals and are discovering the consequences of, of what has been described by some as the dog catching the car. Right. Sure. Right. You know, because all of a sudden it's like, oh, my God, if we, if we actually let these people get their way, it will be very unpopular because these people are fucking crazy. Right. They're yeah, I, I draw, I don't know about you, I draw the line at, at no contraception. That really bothered me, that one. 
Well, I draw the line at women's reproductive rights. Not me. No, I'm. I'm. I really only care about the contraception thing. Oh, so you're okay with the government allow choosing who you get to date? I'm not sure how that affects me as long as I can use contraception. That's really what yeah, irks so me. You will date anyone so long as you can use contraception. Yes. Well, that's probably a good strategy. And <laughs> if you're gonna, if you're willing to date anybody, yeah, by all means, use contraception. <laughs> um, but but you know the the, the reality is. It goes much further than that because they don't want to let you read books that they yeah. don't agree with. They don't want your kids to be taught stuff that they don't agree with. They don't want to um, fund programs that have themes that make them uncomfortable. Uh, that you know, the, these these folks are 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 religious extremists in the vein, and it's not exaggerating of the Taliban. I could not agree more with you on that. It, uh, speaking of the Taliban, you mentioned President Biden. You wrote a whole tweet thread about he and Democrats accomplishments that I thought was really interesting. And there's probably a couple of things you could have actually added uh, because there was just so much. But to see it all there in that perspective and you put it all together in a thread, I just shared it myself because it's so good. And I just wanted to focus in on one of those accomplishments. I think it's interesting because we spent a lot of time, weeks and weeks, talking about it. And you, you were, I think, right from the start, at least in terms of how it affect politics, was the end of a war. America's longest war. Joe Biden ended it. It was ugly. It was messy. Everybody thought it would be. And then there was weeks of, of hand-wringing over how that would affect uh, political outcomes for him, midterms, and so on. How do you think the ending of that war played into the midterms? Zero. <laughs> I mean, I, I think it, I, play, I think it played zero into the midterm. I don't think foreign policy played into it because if foreign policy did play into it, the Democrats would have won many more seats. Yeah, Trump foreign policy, gated community foreign policy, pro Russian foreign policy, anti democratic foreign policy, pro autocrat, pro Saudi, pro um, bad guy foreign policy. Uh, weakening NATO, pulling our troops out of Europe, pulling yeah. our troops out of Asia, building a fence, shooting at immigrants, firing missiles at Mexico. That was Trump foreign policy. And if people really had thought about it, they go, oh, no, we can't we can't let these guys have a chance. And then you go, OK, well, Trump's an outlier, right? Trump's Trump's, you know, Trump's deranged momentary, temporary insanity on the part of the Republican Party. Let's go back to the mainstream Republicans. They gave us the war in Iraq, the biggest foreign policy catastrophe in modern American history. No, they're not good at it. And so I think had people thought about it, this would have been even more resoundingly pro-democratic. And it, and it wasn't. I mean, I think we need to be honest about that, too. This election was 50-50 election. We have a 50-50 Senate. We have a roughly 50-50 House. You know, the states where Republicans did best were loony Florida. OK, let's write them off. They're, you know, crazy country unto themselves. And New York State. Yeah. Every single county in New York State, Republicans did better. So we're not out of the woods yet. Um, and what it's going to take us to get out of the woods is to be as clear about economics and foreign policy as we were this time about election deniers, because election deniers didn't do that well, particularly at the gubernatorial or secretary of state level, because we made the case, you know, just as we made the case about Roe. Right, and, right. And, and we, we, we need to do that on a, on a broader range of issues to recognize that the Republican threat is multifaceted. Uh, are you ready to pronounce uh, President Trump's political ambitions over or Trumpism? What does that mean? Because he apparently is going to announce he's going to run for president again, I guess, when this airs today. What are your what are your thoughts on where he stands? Um, well, I wrote an article months and months and months ago saying stick a fork in him and he's done. That's right. Um, we talked about that. Yeah. And 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 I thought he was done then. And I still think he's done. I mean, I think. You know, we're now about to enter into the period where this dude is finally going to have to answer uh, on some legal fronts, New York and Fulton County, Georgia, and maybe, you know, God willing, the Department of Justice. Although who knows what goes on in that inscrutable building. But, <laughs> but, 
but but you know it's so he's got that he's old and he's the one thing you know the republicans were willing to say you know donald trump he's not a politician he's never done public service he's a serial sex offender he's a liar he's an odious personality he's a racist et cetera, et cetera. they said you know we could we could stick with that on one condition it works and the condition that we actually win election. Yeah. And now, finally, the penny has dropped, and they say, we've lost the last three elections with this guy. Yeah. They didn't notice that they actually lost the first one, too, in terms of the popular vote. Yeah. But, you know, 2018, 2020, 2022, Donald Trump has been the kiss of death. And so it's not going to be morality that will lead them away from Trump. It's going to be that they don't think it works and they'll go to somebody like Ron DeSantis, who is every bit as repulsive as Donald Trump, every bit, possibly, and I say this very cautiously, even less charming than Donald Trump. <laughs> um, and, and they'll go, OK, maybe DeSantis will work, you know, and if that doesn't work, then they'll try something else uh, because Basically, they're just about staying in power, finding a formula that will enable them to advance the agenda of their big dark money donors who want to keep more of their earnings, be less regulated, uh, and have more of their thumb or fist or right arm or left arm on the scale so that their minority can make decisions for the majority in this country. Before I let you go, I wanted to give you the opportunity to plug one of the uh, amazing programs in the Deep State Radio Network, which I think is great. I was just listening to uh, Norm and Kavita and fascinating insights. You get all the smart people over there. Uh, what do you want to say to my listeners about what they should listen to over the, over there? What do you got cooking? Anything? Uh... Well, we got a few things cooking. I mean, we have Deep State Radio, which at the beginning of every week talks about foreign policy stuff. And this week we'll talk about Russia and China. Um, we've got Norman Kavita, as you say, with Words Matter, talking about politics. We do a, a, a weekly show on politics with Simon Rosenberg of NDN and Tara McGowan. And for weeks and weeks and weeks, these folks have been saying, Tom Bonnier has been on a lot, saying exactly what would happen in the election, despite the fact that everybody else said it wasn't. They've been proven absolutely correct. Credibility goes yeah. up. The credibility goes up. We're continuing that. We have my sister's weird podcast called Secret Life of Cookies, where she talks to people about politics while cooking, most recently with Andrew Zimmern. And then, and I know this is really what you were getting at, we, and we have, a we have a podcast also of sort of young voices in foreign policy, which is really Yeah, I like that. And we have a daily podcast on, on breaking news that's 10 minutes long. But... What you're really getting at is that we've done a mini series called American Resistance yes. based on my book, which you probably were going to bring up, American Resistance, the inside story of how the deep state saved the nation, in which each week for the past few weeks, we've talked to somebody who helped inspire the book, Alexander Vindman, Tony Fauci, Olivia Troy, uh, Ambassador Bill Taylor, et cetera. And this week, tomorrow... Our guest is Fiona Hill, and, uh, who is fantastic, yeah. inspiring, brilliant, incisive, no bullshit, and uh, strongly urge you to listen to that. And next week, our guest, and this is really special. Hillary Clinton. Wes me. Moore. No, it's me with Ed Luce at the Politics and Prose Bookstore. Oh, I, and Ed Luce is, in, in, Luce is interviewing me about the book. And I like him. He's got a British accent. He's very smart. Well, you know, everybody falls for that. Yeah, I yeah, I do, for sure. Well, everybody, I look, I'm from New Jersey. You know, if somebody has a Pennsylvania accent, they sound smart to me. <laughs> well, that'll be good. That's, is that, that's coming up? You haven't done it yet? The, the one with Ed we're doing next Monday night. Oh, very exciting. Politics and prose. When you get your book there and you sit down, you get to pick somebody and you sit down and you talk. And, and then yeah, I watch I those on YouTube. Know, if anybody who listens to your show is in the general D.C. metro area, go to Politics and Prose, which is right next door to Comet Pizza, where 
Democrats were eating babies, according according to Mike Flint. Yeah, that's right. That's a it's a great advertisement for that place. It's doing really yeah. well. Well, <laughs> I will have uh, you know what you don't know is I will have mentioned all of that on the intro. So, well, you're very kind to mention yeah. it, and it's good to talk to you about all of this and. I'm glad what happened last week was not as bad as it could have been. Yeah, it could have been uh, a lot worse. Hey, did you see Dave Chappelle's uh, monologue? Do you have any thoughts I, on that? I, I, I have to tell you, I was online and I was doing some work and I had it on in the background. All right, I, I started watching it and I thought, this is the longest monologue in the history of yeah, Saturday Night Live. Yeah. Well, you it give you, on and on and on. you give the greatest stand-up of all time extra time, and you give them a microphone. But I mean, you, you your bona fides with comedy are strong. You're very very funny guy. Your daughter's a comedy writer, and you're also uh, reportedly J- uh, Jewish. I'm reportedly Jewish, and that means I understand comedy. Is that what you're getting at? Ah, well, it's kind of interesting to to see how it's being interpreted and how much things have changed in comedy from a Jewish or black perspective. But I don't know if you saw that Jonathan Greenblatt at ADL called out Chappelle's comments, his jokes as as anti-Semitic, but I'm, I'm, I, the jury's still out for me. I'm a little confused with what folks heard there, but if you didn't hear it, then we know. Jonathan Greenblatt, was my special assistant at the Commerce Department. I love Jonathan. He's a friend of mine. And, I, I like him and, very much. And and so he he literally he worked with me uh, thirty years ago, and I think he's a very smart guy. Um, and I, although I did I, I did not hear the Chappelle show. All right, well then forget it. Then I, I think, won't ask you. I to think come. we have to be super careful about classifying everything that is slightly offensive to a Jewish agenda item yeah. as being anti-Semitic. One of his jokes and, was, I thought hilarious. He said, nothing has ever, nothing good has ever happened to anybody who started a sentence with the Jews. Well, I mean, that's, I didn't tell possibly it well, but. true, but the, you know, it wasn't for lack of trying. And when Hitler started a sentence, the Jews, it actually, the Jews, it, it was, so, you know, so let's let's you know, let's 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 be clear about that. And if somebody started a sentence with any other minority group. Yes. You know, it would be the same thing. So, I, you know, I, I don't know that that's particular comedy genius. You know, you know, there's a vein of comedy, which is let's go straight for the shock value. Yeah. And, and you know, that's fine. But think it through before you speak. I think that is well said, and I appreciate that perspective. And I want to see what you think when you, if you watch it, what you think about it. But well, I'm sure I, you know, I will after I get through all this other stuff. But uh, what with grandchildren? Yeah, very exciting. Go see your grandchild. Congratulations, and thank you very, very much, sir. Thank you, Pete. And I'll talk to you soon. All right, there he goes. Dave Rothkopf on Twitter at DJ Rothkopf. Go follow him. Let him know you heard him here. Listen to his podcast, Deep State Radio. Get his book, American Resistance. Folks, always love talking with Dave. And now it is time to get to my second guest on today's show. He is the Dean of Radio, deanofradio.com. He is on Sirius XM channel 127 weekdays, 6 to 9 p.m. I wonder how he got that slot. I helped him out at the very beginning. We go way, way back, Dean and I do. And this weekend, you can see both of us performing at Gotham Comedy Club as part of the Arab American Comedy Festival. Follow Dean on Twitter at Dean Obadala. Listen to the SiriusXM show. Read his articles at CNN, at the Daily Beast, and more. Ladies and gentlemen, for the first time in a long time, but hopefully he'll be back again soon, my old friend and yours, Dean Obadala. Look who it is, ladies and gentlemen, our old friend, Dean Obidala. Thank you for joining me today. I really wanted to talk to you. Thanks, Pete. Thanks for having me on, my friend. It's great to chat. Uh, Am I going to see you in in the flesh this weekend? The Arab American Comedy Festival. Congratulations. You and Maizun started this like it's the 19th uh, one in a row or something. 19th annual New York Arab American Comedy Festival this weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, November 17th and 19th, Gotham Comedy Club. Great Pete's in one of the shows. He's he, he had a falafel one, so he qualifies. That's how it works at this point. <laughs> you had former sexy part part Lebanese yeah. ArabComedy.com. Check out the tickets. I'll give people five dollar off code of the email me. I'm not kidding for tickets. Uh, just email me at Dean at Dean of Radio.com. But it's really great. We have twenty five about twenty five, twenty six comics from all over the country coming in. 
It's a not-for-profit festival, and it's always a fun celebration. It's such a different climate, though. People, me and Mason started in 2003. It was two years after 9-11. There were no Arab comics. There was, like, a handful of us. There was yeah. no Rami Youssef. There was no Mo Amr. It was a handful of comics out there trying to use comedy to push back against bigotry. That's how simple it was. I mean, if there were, they didn't want to say it. Right. They, they were all Italian. <laughs> Yeah, all, I'm half Italian, so I was like, I'm, I'm Italian, what are you talking about? They're like, your name has Allah, and I'm like, oh, drop the H, it's Obidala. Now no. look at now look at it. I mean, now look at the comedy. I mean, across all cultures, there's so many different kinds of comedians that identify in, like, every possible way. Comedy is, is doing just fine, it would seem. It is, and I think, to me, stand-up is the most democratized form of the entertainment business, and that if you're good... You could open mics, you work your way up. You don't, there's no gatekeeper. It's not like getting cast on a TV show or a movie. To be really successful as a comic, yeah, there's luck involved, there's gatekeepers. But if you become a, a competent comedian, you can make a living. You really could. You travel a lot, but you can do it. And it's, you write it, you perform it, you direct it. It's a rare form of art where it's really you, whatever you want to say, whatever you want to do. And if the audience reacts the right way, you keep doing it. I wanted to ask you what your thoughts were on Chappelle's monologue the other night. You wrote a piece for CNN.com, which is focused on his commentary about Trump is, Trumpism will continue and, and, right. and, and all of the reasons why. But Jonathan Greenblatt of the Anti-Defamation League said that it was anti-Semitic. And I don't know. I, I mean, I love Jonathan and I'm very sensitive to anti-Semitism, as are you. I guess I just I don't know. I, I didn't I didn't see it. And I know a lot of Jewish people didn't necessarily feel that way what are your thoughts on his jokes about you know uh, jews and and all of that that he said about kanye and others right well first i mean i always defer to communities if they say sure yeah they're, they're, yeah. Real, they're under attack or something and then they can explain why because i don't know every anti-semitic trope i don't know every racist type of trope or, or, or subtle things over the years whatever they might be jews african-americans i know when it's arabs or, or muslims and there are times where people are like why was that anti-Muslim? Then I explain, and they go, oh, okay, I see. So, look, when I watch a monologue like you, it didn't jump out of me. I, th I thought it really was a way for him to use comedy to denounce Kanye West, but using it through a comedic prism. And that's, you know, but look, if, if the ADL says anti-Semitic, then I, I don't know why. I saw the headline. I haven't read the article. I don't know why, but look, they can talk about it. They can explain why. And then Chappelle... It's his choice to respond or not in a productive way. But I'm not going to define something. Like, to me, if it was really clear, if, if Dave Chappelle or any comic said something hateful against a group, I would denounce it in a second. I just don't understand this one, so I have to hear it more. But I will say, Pete, my, I've had this conversation with you on scene like 10 years ago yeah. on Don Lemon's show. I've never changed in my standard with comics. If a comic is we are adults, let me start there, right, Pete? We know when someone's being hateful. We know when they're being playful. And they're being hateful. They deserve everything. They deserve every backlash they get. If they're being playful and stumble on something that was inappropriate or wrong or they didn't know, well, the reaction should be different. You should be talking to them and figure out what's going on. And I think right now the, the Jewish community is very sensitive, though, after Kanye. Kyrie Irving was a little different than Kanye. They shouldn't be lumped together, but they are in a way. I mean, Kanye was out there spewing anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish stuff. That was horrible. Kyrie amplifying something that he may or may not understood the implications was a different thing. So, you know, if, if Chappelle's last lines at the end, I, I really liked, and it wasn't about this. He goes, how hard it is now to do shows and how, when you're, and it's when you're famous, like I can say anything in a club yeah. and when someone tapes me, you know, they could hurt my, my radio stuff or something. But if you're a household name, you're held to a much higher standard than right. comics in the clubs. So, well, you wrote this piece uh, for, for CNN.com. Uh, Trump is adored by his followers. Dave Chappelle explained why. What do you think after the midterm elections and Donald Trump announcing that he is, I guess, going to, I guess I'll post this, our conversation tomorrow when he's supposed to announce right. that he's running for president for the third time again. Wh where is uh, Trumpism? The only, play, the only thing Trump should be announcing is what kind of lunch he wants in the prison cafeteria. I mean, there's no, there's no, or he should be announcing that he wants a TV change in the prison rec room to Fox News. The man is a terrorist. Excuse me, excuse me. Can you, can you, excuse me? Can you change that? 
I'm going to be on Fox News in a few minutes. Can you put me on? I'll be calling in from C Block T. It's like, you know, I don't do a Trump impression, but yeah, the Trumpism is not dead. The guy's running for president. It's dead. It's he, if he went away, I will say Americans who believe in democracy, even Republicans, stood up in this election and defeated every single secretary of state candidate in the battleground states who were democracy dem- deniers, I call them. And if they won, they would have been democracy killers. So that's a big thing. But literally now, when we're pre-taping this, right before he went on, Trump was already saying there's fraud in Arizona. He was yeah. sort of hinting it, but now he's saying it. It's not over. He is still beloved by the GOP base. Until he is rejected by the GOP base, then Trumpism is alive, uh, denying elections alive, bigotry, political violence, fascism still lives in this country. Yeah, you and I have been talking about this on our shows with ourselves, with guests, and there were a lot of concerns and predictions about the health or future of democracy in this country. How do you see where we are at now with the midterm elections over, with all of the governors that were election deniers losing, the secretaries of state election deniers also losing? Obviously, several House members that were election deniers did get elected, and we can talk about why that is. But in terms of the health of democracy, you talked with historians like Ruth ben Giat and more about all of this. Where do you think that we're at right now? How are we positioned for the next two years and for in states as well as the presidential election 2024? Well, since I've known the results, I've stopped Googling dual citizenship. You know, <laughs> like a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> like Who would have you? If Trump were to win, I don't know what happens. Like, honestly, if these election deniers won in these states, like Arizona, Mark Fincham, Oath Keeper, big Trump election denier, and Jim Marchant in Nevada, who literally said if he won, Trump would win in 2024. You can't guarantee that unless you're going to rig the election. Right. It, it would be a much more troublesome time for where we're heading as a nation. And I've had so many serious conversations with people who have actually thought about, can I become a citizen in another country? Can I live in another country? Because you, you don't want to be the first one out. You don't want to be the last one out. And that's and I was looking at my language skills, so I'm limited to Canada, England, and New Jersey. Those are my three options right now. You know, <laughs> New Jersey being my first choice. But it's really, I feel, and I took to my listeners, same thing, and on social media, we feel so much more optimistic about the United States of America and also inspired that so many of our fellow Americans stood up and voted these people down. And I'll tell you, it was deliberate, folks, because look, for example, Nevada. In Nevada, the Republican nominee for governor, Lombardo, denounced Trump's lies about the election. During debates, said, I don't believe any of that. He goes, there's always fraud in an election, but not enough to change it. He wins. Jim Marshall, Republican nominee for secretary of state on that same line, big election denier, loses. And in Arizona, Mark Fincham, who I've written about, one of the worst election deniers out there, lost by over 100,000 votes where they could call that election on Friday. Kerry Lake, I know, horrible, but still kind of known. She's down, and it looks like, you know, by the time this airs, she may be declared the loser. It's going to be really hard for her to come back. But anyway, she's tooth and nail. I mean, it's different. People, I think people took it seriously. People, and I think President Biden, he was slammed by people like even by Van Jones and others about this democracy speech. You should be talking about inflation. No, he was doing the right thing by elevating it twice in a month, September and then early November. President Biden, people don't pay attention, go, oh, my God, this must be serious. The president is twice doing national addresses on democracy. Maybe I should actually pay attention. What do you think? How big of a role or what are your takeaways regarding women's reproductive rights, the Supreme Court overturning abortion rights and certain states outlawing abortion there was a lot of talk that that happened, the, the timing of that, the, the rage and anger and energy kind of subsided the closer it got to the election. It would seem that there's a tremendous amount of data that played a huge, huge role in turning out the vote in a midterm election. Do you think there's any way to deny that? What does it mean moving forward? I'm, uh, I'm an abortion freedom denier, so I don't believe that. <laughs> of course I believe it. I think it's made a huge role. I love those polls. There was no data backing up a red wave before the election. I kept talking about it. I kept tweeting about it. I go, here is generic congressional ballot, which is the greatest indicator. And when there was a red and blue wave happening, Democrats and Republicans respectively had eight and a half, nine point leads. And that same average of polls on election night, Republicans had a one point lead. Like there's no wave here. And that discounting, I had right wingers call my show. People care more about inflation 
than abortion. I'm like, that's your male white privilege speaking when you're an older white guy who's upset that Starbucks is five bucks. When a woman has lost her fundamental right to decide her life and her future and self-determination, now that doesn't go away. I think that builds an anger when it's actually enacted. And I think it's 13 states now ban abortion at conception, meaning they've turned religion into law, folks. That's right. Just like the Taliban, they turned religion into law. Texas being the worst, but not the only one. Yeah, I mean, it just it's such a sad way result that that's what turned people out. But there's just there's no doubt that they went way too far. I don't know what that means for the Supreme Court, the the future of this Republican Party. But that is hard to put back in in the box once you've taken those rights away. It's going to continue, I think, to create problems. I mean, that that was the big headline. I feel like right. extremism was what turned a lot of voters off. Not to mention they had no platform or policy I, solutions. I, I think for the younger people, we'll learn more that that really hit them. I saw exit polling showing the number one issue for younger people was abortion. Two, two to one over inflation. Like, you know, a younger person, how many younger people at 19 years old talk about inflation? Yeah. But losing their right to control their body? Yeah, they're talking about that because that's going to affect them the most directly for the longest period of time. And it affects men too. I, I keep... I'm sure you've talked about it. It affects men the most directly, but a husband in a relationship and they're planning to have a child or not, and it's not the right time. And the, the wife gets pregnant, even inadvertently. Well, in those states you're stuck. What if you get a, go on a date and you think the woman has birth control or it fails? Now you, you're mandated for 18 to 21 years, depending on the state, to make child support payments. This directly affects everyone. This affects men and women. It's not a woman's issue. It's a human rights issue. And, and I think that's the biggest thing. I hope the younger people stay engaged and stay active. I think they, I think they probably will, given how many issues affect them. I don't know. When we were younger, I mean, everything was different. There was no Internet or or, or social media. But I mean, from climate to reproductive rights to democracy to so many other ideas and issues, it would seem like young people are going to be engaged, especially on issues like LGBT stuff. I mean, it's interesting to listen to right wing media, which I do pay a lot of attention to. And just how much they focus on all things regarding trans, the surgeries, the hormones and all that. And it's just like, I feel like people, I don't mean to be dismissive to people, young trans people, but I'm just not sure that voters are really that concerned about that issue that they disproportionately talk about on all those shows so much, Dean. Do you think it, uh, that how much effect that's having on young people, much less the electorate as a whole? It's something you have to really dig down for younger people. When I talk to my nieces who are in college and in high school, you know, they come from a place of why are Republicans demonizing these people who are vulnerable, who need help? Right. You know, it's much more about the human side because they know people who are transgender or, or are questioning right now what they're going to go through and what they see is someone who needs to be supported and loved, not demonized for political gain. So it transcends. And I really think there's something else people brought up and it came up on my show that the demonization on the right openly, gleefully of Paul Pelosi and the lies that they smeared. You wonder if that reminded people of Trump's cruelty, which really hurt him with women and suburban women in 2018, midterm in 2020. That it reminded people like, wow, this GOP, it's not just Trump, that these guys are laughing and joking about an 82-year-old man getting a skull fracture. Someone came in, broke in with a hammer and beat him and could have killed him. And they were lies or he's having a sexual affair with this guy and they're just literally making stuff up and being gleeful about it there's a point where you're like that's just despicable like yeah. there's no defense it's not political it's just despicable the other thing is speaking of that the governor of virginia who won i would argue his gubernatorial race two years ago on a lie about what is being taught in school crt he like wrote a handwritten letter apparently apologizing for his kind of joke about nancy pelosi but still the question is about that you know you've got this tweet about how republicans want to ban everything i think that's the other thing you know i was in the fight here in my town at the board of education you know we were going back and forth at the microphone at the meetings on facebook and everywhere else and there was a lot of talk even here just north of new york city about banning books I, more evidence of their their extremism and certainly not really even accurate the things they're saying about it. It's just another ghost issue, it seems, Dean. Like they just they're always screaming about things that aren't really happening and ignoring things that, that are happening here on Earth One, as I call it. The you know that tweet I had pinned to my Twitter account, it goes to really I mean the GOP is banning 
banning abortion, banning books, banning teaching certain classes, subject matter in school, banning saying gay in the case of Ron DeSantis, banning transgender rights, and they're coming to ban birth control and ban marriage equality, and they say they're about freedom, and they're not. I mean, obviously, they're about oppression, and that's what we're dealing with. If I will say this, Pete, like all kidding aside, if you're capable psychologically of forcing a woman to carry a fetus of a rapist a term, you are capable of crimes against humanity. Yeah. If you are capable of the worst sins against humanity. So banning books is nothing to them. You know, like, honestly, if, if you are that twisted and, and callous and cruel that you can force a woman, raped or not, any woman. Like, no, my religion says you have to carry that fetus a term because that's my religion. There's something deeply troubling there about what they're potentially able to do. And I think look at mass movements through time, just for some Google it, folks. I don't need to go into detail. This is what happens. Well, speaking of mass movements, what do you make of the Christian nationalist movement in the U.S.? Does it does it continue to grow? Is it is it just in certain states and certain areas, obviously, more than others? We seem to be so, so divided based on, you know, obvious things that we've, we've talked about that we're talking about every day. But I wonder if they've gone too far with some of this stuff in terms of the results of this election. Well, I'm going to counter with my Islamic nationalism that I'm going to be starting the whole Islamic nationalist movement here to impose, first of all, folks, no more eat turkey bacon. It's just better for you. That, <laughs> it's not about religion. You'll live longer. I don't care. Drink all the whiskey you want, but eat turkey bacon. because it's going to That help should you. go over really well. That'll go over really well in the uh, pork producing state. Yeah, well, cause I'm, not, I'm not running for office I don't, in the pork barrel. I don't care. If I do run for office, I'll be in New York here. The Look, the Christian nationalist movement has been, and I'm sure you have experts on your show. I remember I had Chris Dumai on, who's great, wrote a book, John Wayne, Jesus and John Wayne, about the white evangelical movement. And they've been intertwined in politics like, about since the 90, late 80s, 1990s. And it's been very, very powerful, very effective. Use religion. It really gets people to get engaged, stay engaged, and to get involved in politics. I don't see why it would fade away. It's just such a great recruitment tool for the GOP. The problem for them is they got abortions, and now they have to go to the next step, which is a national abortion ban at 15 weeks. Then after that, it's got to be at 10 weeks, and then six weeks, yeah. and then no exceptions, because that's where they are. It's just a question of how they're going to try to sugarcoat it and sell it to us. Their goal is to ban abortion nationwide. They will Republican elected officials will tell you their goals. Just don't roll your eyes. They're telling you their goals. You... Uh seem to be very impatient with Merrick Garland's Department of Justice. Do you think that he will in- indict the president at some point? Look, I have no insight to what's going on. There are people who get upset with me when I criticize Merrick Garland. I am not telling people he's not going to indict Donald Trump. I don't know. He can indict him tomorrow, right? I don't, I'm not saying he's not going to. I'm saying he should have already because our democracy is at risk and waiting this long is too dangerous for our nation. I'm tweeting a count out now, like how many days since January 6th every day we are. It's almost 700 days since January 6th and Trump's still not charged. He might charge him more likely, honestly, with the documents at Mar-a-Lago, which is a cleaner, easier case in later in the year or early next year than he does for obstructing Congress, defrauding the United States of America, which are two crimes that Judge Carter in, in a whole discovery case with January 6th or a whole privilege case articulated with the two crimes he thought more likely than not, were committed by Donald Trump. Those are felonies, folks. So in Glenn Kirshner, our mutual friend, you love Glenn, I love Glenn. I, I, you're, I don't like that you're really close with him. I wish I was closer with him. But in any event, the, uh, he, he's made it clear that Garland should have charged him, Donald Trump, yeah. by now. And, then, yeah. and now Trump runs for president. This is only in America, folks. You can attempt a coup, incite a terrorist attack, and you get to run for president again. Isn't it great? What do you think about Elon Musk? Do you think about him? Do you talk about him? Do you, have you seen things on Twitter change? I, I don't like Elon Musk. I haven't liked Elon Musk. I wrote an article two years ago when SNL had him host saying he doesn't deserve to host SNL. I was like, guess over a year ago yeah. because he was involved in COVID denying and some stuff from the transgender community was very upset with him. And I, I noted that. I'm like, why would SNL and his COVID BS happen just at the time, someone from SNL, who was a beloved guy, a guy named Hal Wilner, I used to work with, died from COVID. I'm like, why would you have Elon Musk on? I'm like, he doesn't deserve this. And that was my point, not don't invite him. It's more like, have some standards. This guy doesn't deserve it. Now, look, Elon Musk is a troll. He's trolling Senator Markey on, on Twitter over the weekend. 
he said vote Republican. Isn't it funny, Pete, if a corporation does anything that's woke, that helps Democrats, Republicans will go after them. Ron DeSantis will attack Disney and pass laws to hurt them. But and big tech, Mark Zuckerberg's the devil to them. Yeah. But, but Elon Musk can literally say vote Republican and not a peep. So maybe it's not an issue of corporate involvement in politics. It's corporate involvement they don't like. Again, it's free speech and they don't, they're not fans of it. Yeah, the, the hypocrisy is just overwhelming. I, you know, Angela Davis, the, uh, the activist, was supposed to speak at a high school near where I live and, and they canceled her. Wow. Uh, yeah. I'm, I, that's what I heard. And I just can't. Is there a reason or you don't? Uh, I think because she's Angela Davis. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, we didn't Google you before we booked you. Yeah, we yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I got to get the details of it. But I mean, you know, it's just. I can be banned. I mean, for the things I've tweeted and I had an art national review, some guy in national review, I don't even know, wrote an article like a week and a half ago because I tweeted about Elon Musk about, I, this is my tweet. I'm trying to remember it, but I, I started it. And anytime I start as a lawyer, get it, I'm, Kind of kidding. I haven't practiced law in 20 years. So I wrote, as a lawyer, I'm looking into Elon Musk's citizenship application. And if he lied on it, we are going to move. And I put we, there's only me. We are going to move to strip him of his citizenship, right? And clearly, I'm just trolling this asshole. And people on the right went ballistic. And if anyone asked me, I go, I'm clearly trolling. There's no we. And that guy, National Review, went through my Twitter feed for like six years writing an article about all these tweets. And I, 90% I don't remember, but I stood by them. I'm like, yep, that, I, I'm sure at the time that made sense to me. Now, in retrospect, I'm like, huh. a little over the top, a little over the top there. But so, I mean, and the guy was like, he was upset I had Governor Hochul on. And why would Governor Hochul go on this guy's show when he's this firebrand liberal? There was nothing there racist or bigoted. It was all about the GOP being a threat to our nation. And I stand by it. I was ahead of the curve. So... Go after yourself, National Review. I could care less. Uh, let me ask you this quick, because you would, <clears throat> you'd have some uh, perspective. What do you think happened in New York? What happened to this state? We lost the House of Representatives. It comes right to New York. Do you believe it? We let down America. I can't, I'm not apologizing for New York. I'm, I'm, I'm here, but I'm a Jersey guy. The, in New York, they had generated some great maps after the census, and we were going to gain four House seats. We were going to gain four House seats. And the court struck it down, it was unconstitutional, they said. And then we lost four House seats in swing districts. That was a net of eight. We would have, we'd be keeping the House right now. Like, and New York sucked up. And I think it's really over, I think enough Democrats, not enough Democrats thought they were going to lose those swing districts. And that Republicans were emboldened by the, the false polling that was really used very effectively to get yeah. them out. And so they came out for Lee Zeldin especially Long Island, and they flipped some seats that I think we'll get back in 2024. I hope you're right, that they they, they hit us over the head here in, in New York 17, where Sean Patrick Maloney was running yeah. uh, with the with the crime issue. And it was just crazy, because this is the third safest county in America. I've said that like 100 times now. But it's, we then we don't, we not, crime is not a thing that we're dealing with here. So, it's America. You it's know. The crime is the proxy for race. You know, yep. We know that. But yep. for some people are fearful of crime some are fearful of black and brown people it kind of works yeah. perfectly together that's why they do it uh dean thank you for joining me it's great to catch up with you tell all my friends over there i said hello and uh let's let's do this again uh, a lot sooner arabcomedy.com arabcomedy.com i will see you there this weekend thanks pete Have all, a right, day, all right there he goes dean obidala everybody listen to him on sirius xm if you still do such things channel 127 the progress channel that's weekdays 6 to 9 p.m dean of radio.com is the website and of course on twitter at dean obidala you can see us both this weekend at gotham comedy festival the arab american comedy festival i should say and uh, looking forward to seeing him there and that's it. That's all I've got for you on today's show. I'm going to post this baby up so you can bring it down into your ears. Thank you so much for listening, for supporting, for signing up for a subscription. If you haven't yet, do it now. Go to patreon.com slash Pete Dominic or standuppete.com right now. And that's it. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Be the change you want to see. Stay in the moment. Notice that moment between stimulus and response. I'm mostly talking to myself. Bye-bye.
opened up the window to let in some light. You gotta stand up. That's right. You got to rise up. You got to stand up. You got to stare the devil straight in the eyes. We got to let him know it's his turn to go. See it clear and all you hear is a lie. Don't get up off of your butt. Get down off of your fence. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws and since they weren't even sin, they knew. Change was gonna come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We gotta let him know it's his time to go and make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See them flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up All right, we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be told up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no ones and try Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up 